in the day, set apart to serve, part two. We looked at part one last week, we got started, we're going to keep working through this passage in Acts 13 today, set apart to serve, part two, Acts 13 verses 1 through 12. We've been looking now at this church at Antioch, we've been looking at what the church is doing, the work that they've been called to, they've been given a commission by God, and we see here in Antioch this church very faithful in the work that the Lord has given them to do. And praise the Lord for it. We are in the legacy, like we said last week, of this church and many here, many churches today in place because of the faithfulness begun by this church. Now we looked, I want to give you some background, some context here. We looked at verse 1 and we got a profile of this church, what this healthy, biblical, thriving church at Antioch looked like. We looked at the men, the leadership that they had and the importance of that leadership. Then in verse 2, we looked at them ministering to the Lord. They were serving one another in the church, doing the work of the Lord. We're going to see in a moment what that work looks like. But they were doing that to the Lord. They may have been loving their brothers. They may have been giving to support another in their need. They had been reading their Bibles. They were working out their salvation with fear and trembling. They're working on their marriages, raising their kids, doing all those things. But they're faithful in the work that the Lord has given them to do. And it says here in verse 2 that they ministered, their ministering was to the Lord. The Lord is the object of our ministry. The Lord is the object of the, of the work that we do in the church. And you and me being set apart by the Lord to serve when we serve in the church, when we serve out on the field evangelizing, when we read our Bibles, when we raise our kids, when we work on our marriages, we're set apart to serve. We're ministering to the Lord in that way. And we see that in a very real, practical way here at this church in Antioch. This is a thriving, healthy, biblical, dynamic church blessed by God. We said that when you want to have the blessing of God, you want to have the direction of God, you are faithful to God and you serve God now. And that blessing comes and God blesses his church that way. A church that is wallowing, floundering, self-interested, self-focused, doesn't get the blessing of God. They need to be outwardly focused, serving one another, loving the brothers. And so we see this at this church in Antioch. We looked next at their devotion. Out of verse 2, fasting and praying. We said that the takeaway from that is that this is a church that is deeply engaged in devotion to Christ. They had in their mindset that they are set apart to serve the Lord. And in serving the Lord, they're just de deeply de devoted to Him, depending on Him, seeking His direction and His will. And we praise the Lord that they, they have. We'll look at the results of that here soon. The result to them immediately here in verse 2 and 3 is that they begin to be directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actively engaged in this church now commissioning Saul and Barnabas to the work that he has for them to do. The church at Antioch was established because faithful brothers and sisters from Jerusalem, called by God to the work, went to Antioch, shared the gospel, and the church gets established. Now we see Antioch being taught for a year by Saul and Barnabas, praying, fasting, being devoted to the Lord, now directed by the Holy Spirit. Now they send out, they send out Saul and Barnabas doing the work of the Lord, and we're going to see has a great impact on the spread of the gospel, a great impact on the church because of the faithfulness of these brothers and sisters, because of the faithfulness of this church. We want to be a church like that. The result is you get directed by the Spirit when you're doing the Spirit's work. We want to be seized by the Spirit for that. But in verse 4, we see just implicitly put here, they obeyed Christ. They obeyed the Lord. When the Spirit called out Saul and Barnabas, the church apaluo, they released them to the service of the Lord. Now Saul and Barnabas, two of the strongest brothers in that church, they had been teaching them for a year, operating as pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, working in and amongst their midst. This church loved them. These were valuable brothers to them. They're teaching the word. They're evangelizing with them. The church is growing. They have much to learn. But in a year's time, the Holy Spirit takes those strong brothers and uses them. He's going to use them for another purpose that he has. And so they lose these valuable brothers. But the church doesn't shun that. They don't hesitate. They don't shrink back. And they apaluo. They release them to the work of the Lord. And that church in Antioch keeps plugging. And don't you know, God is faithful. I'm sure that God raised up 
good, solid brothers in replacement of Saul and Barnabas at the church in Antioch, so the work keeps going. We see that here, this faithful church. We're going to be planting churches soon. Very excited about that. We're working that direction. We've got brothers who are preparing for that. The Lord at work in locations, you can see it. You've got groups of believers. Even now, there's a group watching in Gainesville. We've got people that have come from the west side, people that have come from the coast. We've got people around that, man, they need a good church. They need a faithful man of God preaching the word of God. They need, they need fellowship of believers. They need one another. They need a church. And so the work of God is going on in that place. We see it here as a commission of God to send a guy to do that work. And God has laid it on the hearts of men in our church to go through college and to, to train for that. So very excited about one day us following suit like this church in Antioch and planning a church for the Lord and the Lord using that to save souls. Just very exciting. We're in the vein of this church at Antioch, but now we need to take exhortation from the church at Antioch and follow through in our faithfulness to God. Now you think about it, this church dynamically thriving and healthy, pursuing obedience to the Lord. We've got to be in that same vein. We're going to pick it up now in verse 5. Look at verse 5, point 2 on your notes. The work here that they've been, been called to do is the work of evangelism. Now, I want you to understand my heart on this. We are in the book of Acts, and we're walking through the book of Acts, okay? In the book of Acts, we've looked at two overarching themes that continuously come out of the text. One overarching theme is the spread of the gospel, evangelism. People faithfully share the gospel with lost people throughout the region. People get saved there are souls that are converted. People are added to the church daily in great numbers. That's the work of the Lord that we see here in evangelism in the book of Acts. Chapter after chapter, passage by passage, one of the great overarching themes of this book is the mission of the church to evangelize. The mission of the church to share the gospel with lost people. That's the mission that God has given us. That's the direction that God has taken us. That's the thing that we're to do. There are lost people. Jesus Christ said that he'll build his church. This is the way he builds it. There's a second overarching theme that we've seen throughout the book of Acts, and that is persecution. The struggling of the church. The church going through difficulty and seeing how God uses that difficulty, uses that persecution to grow and mature his church. To teach the church how to cope with trial so that the church, their faith matures, so they learn how to depend on him. We see them praying. We see them fasting, right? We see their devotion to Christ, their dependence on him. That's how God operates in the church, to build faithfulness, to grow the body. We see these two overarching themes. Now, that does not, you need to keep in mind, we're in the book of Acts. So each passage we come to, we're dealing with those themes. Now, that does not mean that that's to the exclusion of you studying the Word of God. You're commanded to study the Word of God. It's not to the exclusion of you working on your marriage. Men, you are to love your wives sacrificially. If you're not loving your wife as Christ loved the church, you're not fulfilling the role that God's given you as a husband. But now that's not the point that we're seeing in this text right now. It doesn't exclude women. You are to submit to your husband. You are to submit to your husband. That's a command of God. So what we're seeing here is not to the exclusion of that. We're not seeing this to the exclusion of raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're not seeing this to the exclusion of ministering to one another in resolving conflict. We're not seeing this to the exclusion of you gouging sin out of your life. But now week by week, passage by passage through this, what we do see and what we're talking about here, and what we're going to preach, and what we're going to obey, and what we're going to exhort each other to participate in, is the work of the ministry that God has given us to do here, that Christ purchased with his blood, and that's the work of evangelism. In evangelizing, we're going to have difficulty. There's going to be times when we have struggles. There's going to be trial that comes into the church. We know that God intends that for good. What men mean for evil, God intends for your good. And we learn from that. That's the way God blesses. Amen? Amen? We see the fruit of that. We see the even now in the midst of trial, the joy of seeing the work of the Lord go on. And so we've got to be exhorted here and exhorted from this passage with what we're to do. 
In verse 5, the work of the ministry here is evangelism. When Saul and Barnabas are called out of the church at Antioch, it's almost as if that is assumed. Set apart, right? Set apart. That's where the title of the sermon comes from. Set apart for me, Saul and Barnabas, to the work that I've given for them. That work is assumed as evangelism. What was the work that Paul and Barnabas instantaneously started doing? Proclaiming katangelo, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. They started preaching the good news. They started preaching Christ. When the brothers, faithful brothers and sisters, left Jerusalem and they went north to Syrian Antioch and they set foot in Antioch for the first time, that first Christian from Jerusalem, when he set foot in Antioch, what did he begin doing? Evangelizing, katangelo, proclaiming Jesus Christ. A couple of people get saved. God blesses. People get genuinely converted. And you've got a little handful of believers there in Antioch. What do they start doing? Proclaiming, katangelo, Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. Now it says in the Bible that a great number of people came to the Lord in Antioch. So we've got this church, this large church of a lot of people coming to the Lord. What were those people doing in Antioch? Proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ right? Proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ under the direction of the Spirit. They send out Saul and Barnabas. Saul and Barnabas get sent out. They go to Cyprus. What do they start doing? Instantaneously proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ. In Scripture, you see going through. They went through the island of Cyprus from Salamis to Paphos. What were they doing? Going through in Scripture is tied to directly in the book of Acts with preaching Jesus Christ. Paul and Barnabas leave Syrian Antioch. They go up through Galatia. We have the churches of Galatia. The book of Galatians, the letter of Galatians, written to the church in Galatia. What were Paul and Barnabas doing throughout the region of Galatia? Preaching Christ. They were sharing the gospel. People were getting saved. We have those churches being established. Now those churches, they get established. There's a body of believers there. The gospel is spreading. The churches in Galatia, what were they doing? Katangelo. They were proclaiming Jesus Christ. They were preaching the gospel. Paul and Barnabas continue their trek around Turkey, around through the churches of Galatia. They come to, in this case, at the end of uh, Acts 13, they're in Paphos, they're in Salamis. What were they doing? Preaching Christ. Today, we have Romans because Paul preached Christ and those churches were established. We have Galatians because the churches at Galatia were established by this church faithfully preaching Christ. We have Ephesians because they went to Ephesus and they proclaimed Jesus Christ. We have Colossians. We have Thessalonians. We have scripture on the basis of faithfulness to the great commission to preach Christ. Every one of these churches were involved in that. When a church was established, the people of God proclaimed Jesus Christ. And that's what they did. That's the commission of the church. And when they preached Christ, they sent others out to preach Christ. It spread. It wasn't simply that we have a church in Salamis or simply that we have a church in Paphos, simply that we have a church in Antioch. Those brothers and sisters, in faithfulness to God's command, went out and proclaimed Jesus Christ, and the gospel went everywhere. We have churches in Egypt because faithful brothers and sisters proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have churches throughout Europe because faithful brothers and sisters proclaimed katangelo, Jesus Christ. It reached to Britain because faithful brothers and sisters preached Christ. And those faithful Puritans that came from Britain, Huguenots out of France, those brothers and sisters who were persecuted went across the, the ocean, set foot on this land, and what did they do? Preached Christ. And they preached Christ till their death. Those faithful brothers and sisters were out evangelizing, preaching Christ. We have churches all over this country because those faithful brothers and sisters preached Christ. And here, we are in the legacy of that. You are here because some faithful brother or sister preached Christ. This church exists because faithful brothers and sisters preach Christ. That's the work that God has called. When the Bible says here in Acts 13, set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I've appointed them, that work is preaching Christ. And we're going to see that throughout this passage of Scripture. 
We've got to be preaching Christ. And this was an arduous task for Saul and Barnabas. 895 miles in a short period of time, 15 miles a day by foot. And they're out proclaiming Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. This preaching of Christ here, in Antioch, what was the very first thing that was done by a Christian when he got to Antioch? Listen to what we're saying here. He preached Christ. The very first thing that they did when they got to Antioch was they preached Christ. Okay, So you could say then that this is the first works the first works that he did. Now, before we get into this, I want to give you some context here. These first works here by Saul and Barnabas were done in an organized way with a plan. It mentions here in the island of Cyprus two major cities. Both of them were capitals at one time, Paphos and Salamis. Paul did that by design. You see Paul and Barnabas going to major thoroughfares. Now, why is that? They went to Corinth. Corinth was a major trade route. Uh, These cities here, major trade routes. This was an area where the gospel was going to get out. There were a lot of people. This is not pragmatism. This is wisdom. Paul wants to go where the Lord is working and where there's going to be the greatest possible impact for souls to be saved. And so if you have a choice of going into utter no man's land where there's one person every 500 square miles or a a choice of going into a city, a populated area like this where people are going to hear the gospel get converted, Paul and Barnabas have selected large cities trade routes to go and share the gospel in so that people can get saved and the gospel can spread. Now he's also said here that he goes to, look at verse um, 5 here, that the first thing he does, and this is common of Paul, is that he went into the synagogue of the Jews, the synagogues of the Jews. There were several in Uh, this area at this time, went into the synagogues of the Jews. Now, that is by design. We hear in Scripture, or we've talked about before, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. This was a purposeful plan of Paul. Isaiah 49, verse 6, talks about the servant of the Lord. It's the Isaiah servant. This servant of the Lord is to restore Jacob to the Lord and then to be a light to the Gentiles. Paul, by plan, is simply following that prescription in Scripture. He knows his Old Testament Scripture extremely well. He was a Pharisee, and so he knows Isaiah extremely well, and he's setting apart now to do the work of the Lord, and what's the first thing he does? He thinks through Scripture. What's the example that I've been given? What am I supposed to do? And he thinks about Isaiah 49 and his Isaiah servant, and so he goes into the synagogue, preaches to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. That's his plan. What we are to take away from that here is that Paul's not doing this haphazardly. He's not doing this cavalierly or by chance. Paul has an intention. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan, and his plan is based on Scripture. That's the way we need to be. When you're thinking about witnessing, you need to get out and do it, not think about it. When you're witnessing, you need to have a plan that's based on Scripture. Why do we begin with the law of God? Because there's a purpose to the law of God in evangelism. It's why the law was given, and so we use the law when we evangelize. Why are you going to the place that you're going? Why do you check? You have a time, a specific purpose, a a specific plan, because that's what we see in Scripture. Paul here is following Scripture. Scripture needs to be our guide for that. But now, this idea of first works in Antioch, first thing they did was start sharing the gospel. When Paul sets out, first thing he does is start sharing the gospel. When those churches were established, the first thing they did was to start sharing the gospel. Go to Revelation 2. This was, these were the first works of this church in Antioch. It became the first works of all these churches along this region. This was Paul's first missionary journey. He's setting out for the first time here. And what are they doing? They're proclaiming Christ. Look at Revelation 2 and look down at verse 4. For all the good of this church... For all the great things this church was involved in, for the things that they're commended for here, in verse 4, Jesus Christ says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I want you to tie these two things together. You have left your first love in verse 4. So what is the command from Christ then in verse 5? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Those first works there are evangelism. That's evangelism. That is proclaiming Jesus Christ. 
that is taking a stand for Christ, taking a stand for the gospel, that's proclaiming Jesus Christ to a lost world that is on its way to hell so that God can save their soul, build his church as he said he's going to do. Those first works are evangelism. They put boot on the field at Antioch, they're evangelizing, right? But now I want you to see the connection. It's connected here. Neglecting the first works is leaving your first love. Do you see that from this passage? Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So what do you need to do to return to your first love? You get out and do the first works. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. What's the punishment if you don't? Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. First works are tied to your first love. If you're saying your first love is Jesus Christ, then you are doing the first works. To the degree that you're not doing the first works in evangelism, you have left or are leaving your first love. Make sense? That's what Scripture is clearly saying here. The first works in Antioch was evangelism. Evangelism, proclaiming Christ, preaching Christ, is in accordance with your first love, Jesus Christ. That's the mission on this earth that Christ has given us to do. And here, we see it tied to, you leave your first works, you are leaving your first love. Jesus Christ says, repent. Turn from where you have fallen and get back to doing the first works. Because we have a first love. And that first love is Christ. And we serve Him. Now, where does this start? Where does it start to leave your first love it starts with neglect when you are going to leave your first love the, the leaving begins with neglect neglect you start prioritizing other things over the first works if christ is your first love then you follow him and you're following him in evangelism you're following him by being a good husband you're following him by being a good father you're following him by being a good testimony. But you follow him in evangelism. When you leave, you begin departing your first love. You begin departing the first works. And that happens by neglect. And here's examples of how that happens. You used to go downtown witnessing with the brothers on Friday night. And now you're going to play softball. That's how it starts. You used to go out with the brothers and sisters evangelizing on a Saturday morning. And now you take a beach day or you sleep in. Now, is it wrong to play softball on a Friday night? Absolutely not. That's a good, it's a good thing, especially if you're doing it with Christians. It's great fellowship together. But what happens in neglect is that you start replacing evangelism, replacing serving the Lord with something else, and you don't keep up the work. You neglect the first works. I was once witnessing on Saturday morning. I'm going to sleep in on Saturday morning, and so I just don't do it. And by neglect, you leave your first love. By neglect, you cease to do the first works. If you're going to play softball on a Friday night, you're going to take a beach day on a Saturday with the family. That is absolutely awesome, but don't neglect your first works. What would be said of the same thing with devotions? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I need to work. i got to earn money. So I'm going to go to work, and I'm just going to neglect reading my Bible. No, 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 no. You're a disciple of Christ. That is your life. You stay devoted to the Word of God. You don't neglect your first love by departing from reading Scripture. Listen, these first works, this is devotion to God. Here in Antioch, we have the example of a church that is devoted to Christ and devoted to the first works because Christ is her first love. You've got to maintain that faithfulness. Take heed to what the Word of God says, lest you drift away. Stay fervent about the first works. This happens by neglect. Apostasy, getting away. Listen, these churches in Revelation 2. Pretty soon, the church at Sardis, founded in fervency, founded thriving, loving the Lord, their first love, and you fast forward, and in Revelation 2, you have a church that, there's a few in there that haven't defiled their garments. Or the church at Laodicea, Founded on following Christ, founded on the first works, obeying their first love, living fervently for God, and then now you have the lukewarm church, the dead church, and Christ is standing outside the church, pounding on the door. 
waiting for somebody to let him in. This is the commission that God has given us to do, and it cannot be neglected. It gets neglected through leisure. It gets neglected through entertainment. It gets neglected through personal preference. Yeah, I want to do this tonight. There's a show on. It gets neglected in your life because other things take priority and take preference over the first works that God has given you. It gets neglected often if you're not careful in family with your children. You've got to maintain faithfulness to the first works. Otherwise, you've left your first love. And if you've left your first love, the end result of that is your candlestick is removed. Now, if you've left your first love and you don't repent and turn from that, it means you never had a first love. But if you've left your first love, you, that's the grace of God. To know that you need to repent of that and get back fired up doing the first works. And that faithfulness, God will bless. But you've got to repent and follow Christ. You've got to repent and be faithful. Don't allow choices or priorities, skewed priorities, to impact your faithfulness to God. Don't allow choices that you make to steal you away from this work. This church in Antioch is an example. There is a great commission that we've been given, and we've got to stay faithful in that great commission. You will leave before the lampstand of this church is taken away. You understand? You'll leave before that happens. This church, we need to maintain our candlestick. Now, praise God, and I am thankful to God. That's the case. We have a faithful group of brothers and sisters. But the exhortation from this passage of Scripture, this is it. This is the work that God has commissioned us to do. To the degree that we're not fervently engaged in doing that work, is to the degree that you've already begun departing your first love, fire yourself up, gird up your loins, get a backbone, work, get back to the first works, get back to serving the first love in that way. That's what we've got to do. We've got to maintain faithfulness in that area. And so don't allow priorities, don't allow leisure, don't allow those choices to, to get in the way of that. Make a commitment to the Lord, stick with the first works, because he's our first love. We love Christ. You are saved because of Christ, if you're a disciple of his. And so our first love is Christ. We need to serve in that way. Now look back in Acts 13, down in verse 6 and 7. When you do that, when you get out and you're doing the first works, you're proclaiming Christ like our brothers and sisters for centuries have done, when you're proclaiming Christ, you're going to face two things. You're going to face opportunity and opposition. We see opposition in verse 6. We see opposition or opportunity in verse 7. Look at verse 6 with me. Now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. So enter stage right, the opposition. Got a Jew named Bar-Jesus. Verse 7. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Ah, here's an opportunity. An intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now this, they went through. We talked about that. Going through in the book of Acts is tied to evangelism. They were going through. They were proclaiming Christ. That's what the going through, they were going through doing, is proclaiming Christ. But here, when you go through and you proclaim Christ, you're going to come across opposition. Here they come across a pseudo Prophet, literally in the Greek, prophetain, pseudo prophetain, a false prophet, a false preacher, a false guy, error, heretic here. And this false prophet is the opposition that they face in evangelizing. The opportunity here is Sergius Paulus. Here's a man, the Bible says an intelligent man, they've got an opportunity to share the gospel with him and see him saved, but he's got this pseudo prophet in his ear. We'll talk about that. Elymas here, this pseudo-prophet, Bar-Jesus, is one of a long line of pretenders. The Bible is very clear about false prophets. There's a lot of exhortation in Scripture with respect to false prophets. This guy is just in a long line of false prophets. Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Now, we can't see their inside. We don't know their heart. But the Bible says in verse 16, You will know them by their fruits. We have false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves, and you're going to know them by their fruits, by the fruit of their life, by the fruit of their teaching. You're going to know them by their fruits. Speaking of latter days, which we're in in Matthew 24, the Bible says, 
Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That certainly characterizes our day and age, doesn't it? And because of lawlessness, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because of lawlessness, because lawlessness abounds, the love, the first love of many will grow cold. Take this as an exhortation from Scripture. Don't allow your first love to grow cold because you witness lawlessness or because you feel as though lawlessness is abounding. We see great lawlessness. We can't depart our first love. Lawlessness takes place around us. We don't leave our first love. We don't allow our first love to grow cold. Fire yourself up. Gird up your loins. Inflame your heart in devotion and service to Christ. And don't allow lawlessness to dampen or throw a wet blanket on your fervency for Christ. Yes, there are wicked men. Yes, there are wicked men. And yes, there is lawlessness all around us. And the, the world, in the just wickedness, rampant lawlessness. But you can't let that throw a blanket on your first love. The rest of the world can be crumbling around you and you do the first works. You serve Christ. You follow him despite all of that. Don't allow that to, make, to dampen your first love. Don't allow your love to grow cold. Second Peter 2 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Now many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. You see that? Verse 3, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words, but here it is, for a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. God is at work. Their judgment their destruction does not slumber. It is the great forbearance, the great mercy of God that he withholds that. That destruction does not slumber. But listen, God's grace and his mercy and his love doesn't slumber either. God is gracious and merciful. And in the entire time that you see lawlessness around you, the entire time you see God's grace and love and mercy and care for you does not slumber. It's actively at work. Now, I think about the situation that we've been through. And at the same time, this was materializing in God's great love, in God's great grace, and in his mercy. Even at that time, his grace and mercy and care wasn't slumbering. He was preparing us to go through the trial. Preparing us to, to get through, to weather. Preparing us to stay faithful to our first love. Preparing us to continue the work of Christ. Preparing us to make it. Because God loves you and cares for you. And what men mean for evil, God means for good. And so, great joy, great blessing from this. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And here is one of them. Bar-Jesus, Aramaic means son of Jesus or son of salvation. Paul and the son of encouragement, Barnabas here, call him in verse 10 the son of the devil. <laughs> he says son of salvation, son of Jesus. No, this is the son of the devil. This is Bar-Jesus here. He is the opposition. Now, in Scripture, especially going through the book of Acts, we're going to see opposition from a couple of places. But primarily, the opposition that the early church faced was op opposition from something we call syncretism. Syncretism is taking the truth of God and weaving in or blending in error and heresy. You take a truth and you lace it with a lie. That's syncretism. You take the pure, undiluted truth of God and you mix it with linking arms with somebody teaching error. It's that kind of thing. You link it with, with error, with falsehood. And this syncretism that, that Bar-Jesus here, Elimus, represents, this syncretism, is Near Eastern religion. It's the sorcery, the magic. If you remember um, Simon Magus in Acts chapter 8, Simon Magus, Simon the magician, practicing sorcery. 
right? That's something they're facing. In Acts 16, Acts 16, you have fortune-telling in Philippi. That's another example of this, this Near Eastern religion, this syncretism with magic, with fortune-telling, with sorcery. In Acts 19, you have sorcery in Ephesus with a guy named Sceva who claims to be a high priest, and he's got seven sons. We'll get to that story soon. But that's more sorcery in Ephesus. This is something they encountered all the time. Near Eastern religion, this error, this heresy, infiltrating the truth, this syncretism, infiltrating the truth, this was the opposition they faced. Now, this is really excellently identified or portrayed in Elymas because Elymas is a Jew. He's a Jew raised in Judaism, and here he is practicing sorcery. He's the result of this syncretism. Now, as a sorcerer, as a, you know, the, the role that he's fulfilling here, he would have used amulets. He would have used incantations. He would have done spells. He would have been trying to heal. Anything he could do to try to tell the future, try to gain some kind of discernment. And in that role, Elymas would have been right in the ear of Sergius Paulus. It says here he was his advisor. So Sergius Paulus, now the Bible says that Sergius Paulus is a wise man here in this verse, in verse uh, 7, that he's a wise man. But even wise men of the world are easily swayed away from spiritual truth. Worldly wisdom gets you nowhere. Worldly wisdom can lead you to hell. And he's got Elymas in his ear. A lot of people talk about the devil on your shoulder. This is Elymas in your ear. You got Elymas, the advisor, influencing Sergius Paulus with this syncretism and Sergius Paulus is in great danger. We're seeing now, starting in these verses, the war, the spiritual battle for the soul of a man. He is hanging on the brink. If he dies now, he goes to hell. But here, Paul comes, and there's great opportunity in the face of this opposition to share the gospel with him so that he can be saved and go to heaven. So there's a great war going on here. Now, we face syncretism today. And it's a great blight on the church, a great blight on the truth. But the syncretism that we face is a little different. The same error, the same danger, the same infiltrating of heresy with truth, repackaged. And one of the ways that we face syncretism today is something called easy believism. You have the truth of God, and with that gets woven in this insipid, insidious lie from the pit of hell called easy believism that will sway people away from the truth. We'll look at that in a second. The other type of syncretistic heror, heresy, error, that infiltrates the truth is experiential-based Christianity. Experience-based Christianity. You've got another with liberalism. Liberalism has infiltrated the church, but it's always even hard to include them because liberals don't even believe the Bible. We were talking about it this morning. It's like a Swiss cheese study Bible. You know, they, they rip out holes out of Scripture. It really can't be called a study Bible. It more needs to be called like a, a dust-collecting Bible because they don't believe the Bible, they don't read the Bible. But this liberalism infiltrating the church, great holes in Scripture, uh, they just don't believe it. They don't believe it. So we don't even pay attention to that one right now. Really, our basis is easy believism and this experience-based Christianity. And here's the root of that. You have the salvation of God being a salvation that radically changes your life. You've got those in easy believism that say, I believe this set of facts, therefore I'm right with God, I'm a Christian. In experiential Christianity, you've got those that say, I feel this way, or I have experienced these things, therefore I'm a Christian. Now if you're a Christian, you say, man, God saved me. And God saved me because I was this wretched sinner living in my sin, and God tore up my heart over that. I realized what a wretch I was, and God changed my life. God gave me his spirit, and that sin I once loved, I now despise. I had no interest in his word. Now all I want to do is study his word. I had no interest in telling anyone else. Now I want to tell people. I, had a, I have a zeal and a love for God that simply wasn't there before. There's a radical change in your life, right? I hate my sin, where before, you didn't hate it. It's a radical change in your life. Now, what's being done here, now, if you're, if you're a genuine disciple of Christ, you say, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. If you're not a genuine disciple of Christ, you're not converted, you're saying to yourself, well, that's not how I got saved. And you're waiting on God to finish some work that you twist scripture to say he started at some point. 
The salvation of God is a miraculous, radical changing of your soul, a changing of your nature. It is reconstructing you from the inside out. It is radical change by God. You become someone who once despised the things of God, took no interest whatsoever in the things of God, and now you are inflamed with love for Christ, inflamed in service to Christ, wanting to obey him. It's a radical life change. The easy believer, the experiential, it simply takes that miracle away. It simply pulls that out. It's a, I'm going to rewrite with God, and I'm going to rewrite with God based on this set of facts. I believe these facts, and so I'm a Christian. Or, this happens to me. I rattle off in some gibberish that's not in the Bible, and because of that experience, I'm a Christian. Or I feel this way. I've grown up, and I just know that God is with me. Listen, that's experiential Christianity. That's not Christianity at all. That's syncretism. That's blending lie with the truth. When God saves, he turns you from your sin. He gives you a heart that is devoted to him, that loves him, and he causes you to follow him. That's Christianity. We're, we fight that syncretism all over the place. You stand at the door and you witness to someone, and they say, I'm a Christian. I've been saved for 42 years, and they know, look, look no different 42 years later than the day they say they got saved. There's no power of God in their salvation. Salvation is a radical life change. It's not easy believism, and it's not experiential in that sense. Are there experiences as a disciple of Christ? Absolutely. Great experiences you can praise God for. That's in accord with his word and in accord with a radically changed life. That's the syncretism that we face even today. You, in your situation, do you have an elimus in your ear? When you witness on the street, you witness downtown. You go to door to door. You're witnessing to somebody in the mall. You can believe they've got elimus in their ear coming from somewhere. It's a false teacher. It's a TV evangelist. It's a, a friend. They're saying, you know, what are you so worried about. You're a Christian. Look how good you are. You've been going to church since you were two. So obviously you're a Christian. You got Elymas in your ear. Blending of error with truth. You need to gouge Elymas out of your ear and kill him and follow Christ. Follow what the word of God says. Here we're going to see Paul do that. Paul is going to separate this wicked false teacher from Sergius Paulus. And the reason he's going to do that is because Sergius Paulus, is, his soul is in jeopardy here. So now we have the opportunity in verse 7. He was with the proconsul, this wicked Jew was, uh, this wicked false teacher. And it says that Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, hopefully because Sergius Paulus wasn't just swept away with his idiocy from Elymas, but this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Now, Barnabas and Saul were so about the work of God here that they caused such a stir that the proconsul heard about them. Now, the proconsul was the leader over this area. To, to give you an example of, Luke here knows what he's talking about. There are people who are constantly trying to poke holes in the scripture. This is just a, an example of Luke knowing his stuff. It used to be called an imperial legate. The guy that was over this area had troops that he commanded, and he reported to the emperor. Here, Luke accurately calls him a proconsul. That was a recent change before this time. And a proconsul was somebody who had no troops that answered to the Senate. And so here he accurately describes who this guy is and said he's an, an intelligent man. We hope that he's here going to be saved and we find out that he is because he's going to listen to Paul and Saul and Barnabas. He's intelligent in the sense that, hey, I want to hear what they've got to say. The fact that they were causing such a stir that he heard about it and then sought them out is amazing. They are doing the work of God. They are out sharing the gospel, katangelo, preaching Christ, so much so that the leader of this area hears what they're doing. Okay, I need to talk to these guys and calls them in. We need to make that kind of stir. You need to make that kind of stir. We can make that kind of stir. We have made that kind of stir in this church. We got guys, people know what this church is about. This church is about preaching Christ. And they hear about that. You got to keep that going. Make it your object to cause a stir for Christ. And these guys are causing a stir for Christ. So they come in, and here is Sergius Paulus with Elymas in his ear. Now, Paul recognizes this as a spiritual battle. And Paul here is engaged by God, called out, separated to serve for the purpose of engaging in this spiritual war. Go back to Acts 13 and look at verse 8. Verse 8. But Elymas the sorcerer, 
for so his name is translated. It's just that he was called that, not that there's any translation for Bar-Jesus. But withstood them. He withstood Paul and Barnabas, seeking to turn Diastrepho, the proconsul, away from the faith. This word Diastrepho literally means he was taking Sergius Paulus, and his object was to turn him away from Christ, to stand between Christ and this man, to get him away from the church. Now, Paul and Barnabas are there to turn him to the Lord. They want to turn him. You see the battle already, right? You've got the sides. You've got the war. This is set up. We see this. Sergius Paulus is being turned by Elymas away from Christ. Elymas is a satanic plant to do this. In the same way that God uses you and uses means in the preaching of the gospel to save souls, Satan does the same thing. There are satanic plants, satanic influences, elements in the ear that are there because they are diastrepho, turning away people from the faith. It is, they're a satanic plant. Now, that's, this man's soul is at stake, and he's got this guy in his ear. If you're a disciple of Christ, you're in this battle. You are signed up for this war. If you're not in the battle, listen, you are not in the army. you got to get in the battle. This is a spiritual war for this man's soul. You can go anywhere around here, and there's that same battle going on. Somebody's sitting there listening to some false teacher on the TV. Somebody's sitting there listening to a friend feed them lies. Somebody going to a church where the pastor is up there not preaching the truth of God. They've got Elymas in their ear, and their soul is at stake. And you are the one with a weapon in your hand. You're the one enlisted in the army. That God has called you to this work. And the work is proclaiming Christ. And here Paul does that. Paul sees this as a spiritual war, an all-out war against the forces of hell for this man's soul evangelism is not an academic exercise. You see a JW or a Mormon, they're doing it like an academic exercise. The people of Christ do not see evangelism as an academic exercise. This is a battle for someone's soul. This is someone who needs to be saved, who needs the Lord. And, and Sergius Paulus here needs the Lord. This substitution that Elymas is promoting here, this syncretism, happens in multiple ways today. One of the ways that it happens in the church is by separating the people of God from the mission of God. You've got to separate from that. You've got to get into the work, get into this war. Point three on your notes here now, because of this, because we see this set up here, you are set apart to serve so that you can bear fruit for God, bear fruit for Christ you're set apart to serve, to get into this spiritual war, to get into this battle, because souls are at stake. Verses 9 and 10, chapter 13. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Literally, the, in the Greek, that word is, man, he's dead eye on Elymas. You can almost see Paul just take a step forward, lean up point his finger at him and say, you listen to me. <laughs> it was like that guy, he looked intently at him. He means business, right? This is Paul meaning business with this guy. Uh, he's about to get it. Verse 10, and said to him, now listen, Paul in verse 9 was said to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look here at what Elymas is full of. And he said to him, O oh, full of all deceit, all fraud, you son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting? That word for perverting there? Diastrepho. Turning, making crooked, right? Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And Paul is leveling a rebuke here. And he's leveling this rebuke because his soul, Elymas, or, um, Sergius Paulus's soul here, is at stake. It says he's filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul is. That spirit Filling there is just an empowering enablement for the work that Paul is about to do. When you're witnessing, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if you felt this, just the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the, in the conversation that you're having, you just feel help from the Holy Spirit. You feel aid. I feel that when I preach the gospel. I feel that when I preach sometimes. Just the aid of the Holy Spirit working at work in the situation. Here, Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit for the work that he's about to do here, rebukes this wicked false teacher. And Elymas then being filled with literally all villainy, 
all trickery, all wickedness is what it means. An enemy of righteousness constantly making crooked the straight paths that God reveals to his people. God gives straight paths, and you've always got an elemis in the ear out there wanting to pervert those, wanting to make them crooked, wanting to turn you from the faith. But Paul here is not going to take it. And we see that making perverted, crooked paths all over the place in Scripture. Go back real quick to Jer Jeremiah 5. Let's just take a look at one quickly. Jeremiah 5. This is the false teacher. This is what they do. And this false teacher in the proconsul's ear is causing trouble. Jeremiah 5, and look down in verse 26. Jeremiah 5, 26. It's always been so. There's nothing new under the sun. God says, For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. Get the, the picture there. They set snares. They set a trap for men, for men's souls. That's what Elymas is doing here. As a cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. This sounds like most televangelists today. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible Thing has been committed in the land. God calls this an astonishing and horrible thing. Verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. Man, you get false professing Christians today that love to have it so. They love to have Elymas in the ear, and they love that comfort. But what will you do in the end? The people of God stand for the truth of God. Look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter. This is dangerous because these guys can lead people to hell. It is not right to say, well, God will save them anyway. It's not right to say that. God uses means. I don't understand how the sovereignty of God works perfectly with the responsibility of man in every case. But God uses means. And if Paul had not been here Sergius Paulus would have continued to listen to Elymas in his ear and would have gone straight to hell. But God uses means, and Paul here does the work that he's supposed to do. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, and look down at verse 18. 2 Peter 2, verse 18. For when they, these Elymas in the ear, when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For, here it is, by whom a person is overcome. By him also he is brought into bondage. This is no cavalier war. This is no light thing. False teachers, heresy, insidious syncretism, error, elements in the ear, is a life or death problem. It's a life or death battle, and you've got to be, as a disciple of Christ, you have the truth. You've got to be engaged in that battle. If you say you have this treasure, you say you've got the truth, well, there are people out there who need it. So get in the war. Get in the fight. Help them gouge Elymas out of the ear. These men can lead people to hell. They can be overcome, taken into bondage. Now, Paul doesn't hesitate here. He's got the authority of God's word, and we're going to see him take a swift rebuke here to Elymas in verse 11. Back in Acts 13. Let's see what Paul does here. Acts 13. And look down at verse 11. And now indeed... The hand of the Lord is upon you. Now we have the, the hand of the Lord upon Elymas in judgment. We've talked about the hand of the Lord before. The hand of the Lord on Elymas in judgment. But see here, we see the hand of the Lord with Paul in blessing to the salvation of Sergius Paulus' soul. 
you've got the hand of the Lord in blessing and the hand of the Lord in judgment, okay? So now the, the hand of the Lord is upon you, Elymas, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist, literally mist and darkness, fell on Elymas. That mist is like a cold shudder, ugh, you know, and the darkness, the blindness comes so much so that he has to be led around by a hand. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Here, Elymas gets blindness. The proconsul gets sight. This is an intentional contrast here. It's very intentional. You have Elymas, a Jew, raised in Judaism, a part of the inner religious circle, so to speak, and you've got Sergius Paulus, a Roman Gentile, outside of organized religion. Elymas gets rebuked and blinded. Sergius Paulus gets saved. This We face opposition over here all the time, don't we? All the time. It's that religious elite. It's that syncretism, that heresy, that error. That's the elements in the ear. That's the opposition that you face. That's the opposition to battle. That's the, the battle that we face today. But over here, you've got the work of God. Now it says here, literally, literally in the Greek, having seen this being done, the proconsul believed being astonished at the teaching of the word of God. Now think about that. It's not experiential faith, him being astonished at the miracle. Wow, look at that miracle. Now I'm a Christian. I believe, and so now I'm a Christian. It's not it at all. Sergius Paulus saw the miracle, but was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. If you've come to Christ, man, you think to yourself, man, praise God. Look at God's word. God's saving me? You're just astonished at the word of the Lord, astonished at what God has done in your life, astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It's that astonishment that in my sin that God would save me. And in, my de in Egypt, in the bondage of my sin, that God would take me out of that and cleanse me and give me a clear conscience, a clear heart, clean, wash me with water despite my wickedness and save my soul. And I'm astonished at the teaching of the Lord and astonished at God's salvation. You should, we are astonished at God's salvation. No miracle can take the place of that. The miracle is the radical changed life of someone who's been seized by God and saved. That's the miracle here. And that's the miracle that Sergius Paulus is astonished over. But now, what if Sergius Paulus saw that miracle, says he believed, and he never obeyed? He never followed Christ. He didn't follow through with his first works because of his first love. He kept doing what he was doing. Well, he's got an experiential faith and not a saving faith. Make sense? Saving faith is a, is a faith that changes your life. It's a, cha a faith that changes who you are. And we see two different styles here with Paul, quickly before we close. One with Elymas and one with Sergius Paulus. Preaching the gospel to Sergius Paulus so that Sergius Paulus can be saved and a stern, hard rebuke against the false teacher. There is a time and a place for that. I remember witnessing one time. I was uh, talking to a lady and uh, pleading with her for her soul. And we're standing in her front yard. She's weeping, and she's weeping over her sin. And the Lord is obviously at work on her heart. She's soft, just fruit, right? And just you see God at work on her. And so I'm very encouraged by this conversation, looking forward to following her up. We get in the car, and we start leaving from there. And as I'm leaving, um, the person I was with forgot to get the address so we could follow her up. I turn around. As, I, as I'm turning around, coming back up the driveway to Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, you see the work of God in her heart, in her weeping over her sin, in seeing the truth of God from God's Word. And then you have these two Elymases up the driveway to stick their false heresy in her ear to pervert her from the straight paths of the Lord. And so what followed was a stern rebuke. I don't want to let that happen. You, there are times when you get out of the car and for the purpose of someone's soul, you go back and level a rebuke against a false teacher. We have to take a stand for the truth. There is a war going on for people's souls. 
and their soul hangs in the balance. You've got to get engaged in the battle. You might wonder today where the church would be if the church succumbed to Elymas in the ear. Or if the church succumbed and left their first love by departing from the first works. If the church succumbed and didn't send out Barnabases and Sauls to preach the gospel. You were all called to the work as a Saul and as a Barnabas in this community. We've got to get out and get the work. Without that, there'd be no Romans. There'd be no Corinthians. There'd be no Galatians, no Ephesians, no Philippians, no Colossians. There'd be no Thessalonians. There'd be no church. We're called to that work by God to engage in that battle for the salvation of souls. You've got to get fired up to get, don't allow lawlessness to make your love grow cold. Don't allow other priorities to pull you away from the first works. You've got to serve Christ and engage in the battle. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you, Lord, for this exhortation from Scripture. Thank you, God, for the examples that you give us to follow. Think about these faithful brothers here. And just the boldness of Paul on the authority of your word to lovingly share the gospel with now your saint, Sergius Paulus, and to stand on the authority of God's word to turn away that wicked false teacher out of his ear, to rebuke Elymas. God, and thank you for his example. God, thank you for your word and your example in evangelism, going through preaching the gospel, proclaiming Christ. Lord, I pray that you would apply these truths to our heart for faithfulness to the Great Commission, for faithfulness to get out there, Lord, engaged in the battle to see souls saved for your glory and your great namesake. And even now, Lord, there are so many Elymases out there. God, the world is full of them. And we pray to you, Lord, come quickly. God, come quickly. Even now, Lord, come quickly. That as you tarry, God, and we know we have got work to do, inflame our hearts in devotion to that work for your namesake, for the salvation of souls, Lord. We love you. God, you are our first love. And Lord, we joyfully join you in the first works that you've given us to do while we're here. Take great joy in that, God. Help us to be faithful. Help us to cling tighter to that, tighter to the cross, tighter to you, Lord. Praise you and thank you for all these things. Thank you for your people, God, and the faithfulness of your people. We praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.